Okay, so we're gonna to switch topics now and begin discussing barrier synchronization. So I'll start by explaining what barrier synchronization is in general, and I'll talk about three different ways of using so-called barrier synchronizers. And I'll also give you a, an example of a human known use of synchronization involving barrier synchronization. Earlier discussions we've had on synchronizers have focused on classes that affect the behavior of individual threads. For example, atomic operations are actions that either happen all at once or don't happen at all, like the transporter beam we talked about. Mutual exclusion synchronizers allowed concurrent access and updates to shared mutable data without incurring race conditions, so it allowed you to have threads take turns accessing critical sections, typically one at a time. And coordination synchronizers like Java condition objects and so on ensure that computations run properly in the right order at the right time under the right conditions, etc. So those are the three general categories or types of synchronizers we've talked about heretofore. In contrast, a barrier is a synchronizer that ensures one or more threads have to stop at a certain point and it doesn't allow them to make forward progress until all the other threads reach that particular point. So it's a little bit different flavor. So the key points there is you've got multiple threads involved and they all have to kind of wait and then they can all proceed in, in one fell swoop, if you will. There are typically three ways you can use a barrier. And I'll be using a video rendering engine as a running example as part of this lesson, just, just to make it concrete. So the first way you can use a barrier is as a so-called entry barrier. And what that does is it makes a bunch of computations wait to begin until something is initialized. So you say, you know, you gotta wait until you can begin to make progress on some initialized data structure. So using our video rendering engine as an example, you might have a main thread spawn a bunch of worker threads, and then the main thread performs some time-consuming initializations of data structures, and the worker threads have to defer doing any work until the main thread tells them it's possible for them to make progress. So the worker threads will wait on the entry barrier until the main thread completes the initializations. Once the initializations are done, the main thread decrements the entry barrier to zero. Notice it was one before. Now it's zero, and that basically tells all the worker threads they can start to do their thing. So in this case, we have an initialization done barrier. That's the barrier's name, and so you have to wait for the initialization to be done before you can make forward progress. So that's kind of an entry barrier. You don't get to move in until everything has reached a stable state. There's also something called an exit barrier, and what that could be used for is to not allow a thread to keep working until a bunch of other threads have finished what they're doing. So in other words, the thread can't exit until the other threads are done. Going back to our example, the main thread, after it initializes uh, the data structures and sets the worker threads in motion, it will then wait on an exit barrier, which I've called M conversion done barrier, until all the worker threads are finished. So it starts out, initializes stuff, lets all the threads run, then it waits until all the threads are finished, and as each thread finishes, it decrements the count by one, saying I'm done, and then when it's finished, the exit barrier count equals zero, and that's an indication the main thread can then continue to do its thing. So that's an exit barrier. And then the third form, which is sort of a variant of the other two, but has a certain little twist added to it, is a cyclic barrier. And that's where a group of threads all have to wait for each other to reach a certain point before they can advance on to the next, next phase, the next cycle. And you'll see that, as we'll talk about later, you can have a fixed or variable sized pool of threads that can run concurrently using a cyclic barrier to coordinate their action. At the end of each cycle, the threads can decide if they want to continue or not. And we'll talk about how that works shortly. There's a number of different human known uses of barrier synchronization. I'll show you some other ones as we go through the slides. This is just one to get things started. Having spent uh, time in, in Portugal recently looking at museums, Portugal is a great place to go, by the way, a wonderful country. 
uh, they have a protocol for working with groups of tourists who want to tour something in a, in a museum. I also went to the Museum of Modern Art in New York City, which uh, has got some really cool stuff, really great paintings, really famous paintings there, like um, Salvador Dali's The Persistence of Memory, which is the melting clocks, which is a classic painting. But there's also a lot of junk. So if you, if you like really, there was my favorite picture, in fact, in the, the Museum of Modern Art was literally a blank canvas. It was like five feet by five feet, just blank. And it was hanging up on the wall. Like, I can't even begin to imagine how much the person charged to, to paint the blank canvas. I posted it on my Facebook page, and I was like, what is this? And someone said, it looks a lot like the Beatles' White Album. Right? So I thought, all right, well, OK. <laughs> I wonder how much they paid people to design the art cover for the, the White Album. Um, so anyway, you're in a museum. You want to take a tour. So typically, there's an entry barrier. You might say the next tour starts at 10 AM. and so. Basically, you have to wait as a group until 10 a.m. arrives, and then you can go en masse to start the tour. So that's kind of an entry barrier. If you show up at 9.30, you just have to wait until 10 o'clock when the tour starts or the museum opens. So that's an entry barrier. Likewise, I think I've talked about this before, you don't let the place, the museum, shut down until the last tourist leaves. So you keep track of that by some kind of counter. So that would be an exit barrier. And then a cyclic barrier might be you're walking with a tour guide through each room in the museum, looking at different styles of painting, for example. And so you basically wait for everybody to finish touring a room, and then you proceed as a group to the next room. That's kind of a cyclic barrier. As you can see here, cyclic barriers could be used either as entry barriers. You have to get the whole group to be there before you can start. And you can also use a cyclic barrier as an exit barrier. You wait till everybody's done, and then you move to the next phase. It's also worth noting, as we'll see later, that barriers can be either fixed or variable sized in terms of the number of tourists. And um, you know, it might be that, you, that the tour guide will keep track of the people by their count, and then you only proceed. Or it might be some people drop off at certain points along the way, and they don't continue, kind of like a hop on, hop off bus tour. But uh, you still have a way to make sure that you don't start until the next phase. OK, so that's just a quick overview of barrier synchronization, and of course we'll talk about how this is supported in Java in the next discussion.